Good afternoon, and welcome to the Brain and Behavior Research Foundation Meet the Scientist monthly webinar series. I'm Dr. Jeff Borenstein, President and CEO of the Foundation, and your host for today's webinar. Today, Dr. Yasmin Hurd will present Addiction, Science Drives New and Novel Treatments. The Brain and Behavior Research Foundation funds the most innovative ideas in neuroscience and psychiatry to better understand the causes and develop new ways to treat brain and behavior disorders. These disorders include addiction, ADHD, anxiety, autism, bipolar disorder, borderline personality disorder, depression, eating disorders, OCD, post-traumatic stress, and schizophrenia. Since 1987, the foundation has awarded more than $418 million to fund more than 6,000 grants around the world. I'm delighted to introduce Dr. Yasmin Hurd. Dr. Hurd is Ward Coleman Chair of Translational Neuroscience, Director of the Addiction Institute and Professor of Psychiatry, Neuroscience and Pharmacologic Sciences at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. She is a member of the BBRF Scientific Council. Today's webinar will begin with Dr. Hurd's presentation. This will be followed by a question and answer period. To submit your questions, please use the questions tab on the control panel on your screen. Please feel free to submit the questions at any time following the presentation. I'll ask as many as possible in the time allotted. And now, I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Hurd. Yasmin, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, I, I really appreciate being here. And um, now we'll, they'll give me uh, the possibility to share my slides. And I'll, I'll start talking about addiction and what we have learned from, uh, I'm sorry, let's see. Um, could you share the slides? Uh, absolutely. I, I did pass on the, the presenter uh, message to you. No? Oh, interesting. Didn't come up. Let's try again. Okay, here we go. Now. Okay, uh, just one second. We're seeing just a blank slide. If you can click on it, maybe. Or perhaps stop sharing and then, yeah, let's try it again. Same thing. Yeah, okay, yes. there we go. Thank, Thank you. you. So thanks very much for being able to share, you know, um, what our research and others have been really delving into in, in regard to the neuroscience of addiction in order to try to help to see if we can drive new th treatments. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to um, start off by emphasizing the big impact that addiction has in our society. And I don't think that anyone perhaps listening um, doubt the impact. We have over uh, 40 million people with a substance use disorder in the United States. That's more than many of the medical disorders, including you know, heart disease, um, diabetes, and so on. And that's just people with a diagnosis. If you think about people who have high misuse of it, that number gets even larger. And the the fact is that because of this high prevalence, the substance use disorders cost our society tremendously. And let's not forget the emotional um, and personal trauma and economic and costs, not even economic costs, but to the individuals and their families and communities. We are overwhelmed with the number of um, substances that are uh, available for uh, misuse and abuse. But on top of that, we have, you know, the overdose the deaths that are, are um, I'm sorry, I'm trying to just move my, my uh, this, uh, the webinar <laughs> from blocking all of my slides. Um, you know, the overdose deaths that we have been, um, uh, our society has been experiencing the past decades, but all of this together and the economic burden, as I mentioned, you know, has put our healthcare system, as we call it, like under siege due to substance use disorders. Mm -hmm. And 
I try to emphasize that many people think that substance use disorders are just, you know, um, perhaps young people, but this is a, a disorder that covers the lifespan, and it's from, you know, from in utero to the geriatrics and even even beyond. One of the things that was clear to us um, is that, you know, COVID, which is a has been a horrible thing um, throughout the world in our the pandemic, the stress and isolation um, associated with COVID uh, contributed to even greater drug use, and not even drug use among people with a substance use disorder, even those who did not have one before COVID. And the numbers show that the increased use of, of drugs, it's many drugs from the opioids to psychostimulants that have increased during the, the, the past year. And importantly, even though this, um, you know, the, the pandemic is awful, over 85,000 people died last year due to drug overdose. And this epidemic of drug overdoses, I, I think sometimes has gotten lost, um, understandably in terms of with the COVID um, pandemic, but we can't lose sight of that. It, it's really critical to understand. So when, you know, we have this huge problem in our, in our society and in our healthcare system about substance use disorders, and obviously the whole goal is to be able to treat people in order to give them their lives back. And when you look at the treatment for substance use disorders, it's actually in a way quite, you know, dismal. Believe it or not, there was a morphine maintenance clinic that in the 1990s, and you've had many di um, different medications that have been developed through that time. Well, I won't say many, I should have put this to 2021 20, um, really. And when you look at the classes of, of medications that have been developed, they're, they're very few many of these actually have to deal deal with treating opiate use disorder and when you look at the the medication that's most widely used for example methadone that was introduced in 1964. so we have not really developed even non-opioid um, medications since 1964. we've changed different aspects like buprenorphine and so on but they're still opioid drugs so this is a huge problem because many of the, the the medications that are used to treat substance use disorder and trust me they do help save millions of lives so it's not that we're saying to get rid of them the, the problem is that only a, a very few percentage of people who actually need treatment for substance use disorder actually receive it and there are also behavioral interventions that are very important and and, and powerful as well however we have a huge issue with the fact that treatments are in, that are even available are not being effectively utilized. And a lot of the, the, the issues come down to um, aspects of stigma. Stigma in for the patient population, that many people just think that substance use disorders are you know, due to moral weakness and so on. Uh, obviously, a lot of the governmental regulations when you are trying to treat um, people with a um, substance use disorder with the same type of medication, for example, methadone, an opioid for an opioid in terms of harm reduction. But so it comes back to like, you know, these science-based novel treatments. Um, there have been barriers to that on, on a number of levels that we can talk about, but there is a science to it. And part of the science also deals with the fact that, and coming back again to some aspects of stigma, that where many people may feel that one substance use disorder is not really a disorder when it is an actual medical disorder, it's a brain disease, but they, they realize that you know only a certain percentage of people actually who experiment with drugs go on to develop a substance use problem. And that is a big aspect I think that is important to understand in order to help um, develop even individualized um, treatments for substance use disorder. So when you look at addiction risk, I'm just going to give a general, I'm not going to go into to the neurobiology of addiction risk so much today, but when you look at addiction risk, we know a couple of things that impacts on the brain that enhances sensitivity to addiction. So the neurodevelopmental processes absolutely is critical and not surprising, environmental factors such as stress, impoverished conditions, and I don't just mean poverty, there are many different things that impact on uh, in, um, the conditions that someone experiences during development, and of course, early exposure to drugs. On top of that, we know that genetics also plays a role, and together with the environmental factors, um, leads to these what we call epigenetic changes. 
that it's not changing the DNA, it's, not, it's the environment can impact on how the DNA is in, in one way being um, read. And altogether, we know that those contributes also to psychiatric traits and psychiatric um, behavioral traits and psychiatric comorbidity that often go hand in hand with addiction risk, whether it's reward sensitivity, anxiety, depression, and aspects of impulsivity and inhibitory control. But even with all of that, you know, it's important to know that without taking the drug, those who are, um, le who are very vulnerable to addiction risk some, out of no fault of their own often, they're, they're much more likely to get into this ish, into this problem. And so there are many different aspects of how we study um, the neurobiology of addiction in order to get insights into how we can help mitigate some of these risks. A lot of research has gone into understanding the neurobiology of addiction. We know a number of the brain regions and their particular role that they may play in specific aspects of addiction phenotype. You know, many people know of the nucleus accumbens, this area in our striatum that's important for reward, reward, especially reward expectation, goal-directed behavior. Um, other aspects of the cortex, which is really important for cognitive control. Um, the amygdala, which sits in, you know, um, our temporal cortex, and that's important for emotional regulation. And the hippocampus that stores a lot of the, the contextual memory with, with drugs and so on. This is just a few slides just showing, you know, one of the things that people, like I said, in terms of um, the stigma of addiction, oh, this person should be able to control their, their behavior. When you look at people who have a substance use disorder in their, in, for example, neuroimaging studies, you see that their, this lower orbital frontal cortex is significantly impacted, both on a structural level and on a functional level. And a lot of the, the, the changes are similar to what you see in people who actually had um, perhaps a, an, a lesion or a damage to um, this area that are not drug induced. And you see the similar things in those individuals, poor decision making, poor impulse control, emotional ability, you know, again, aspects of um, temporal discounting of reward, aspects of impulsivity. In the in the striatum, which is a brain region highly, highly, highly implicated in, a, in addiction, like we know, as I said, the nucleus accumbens you see activated when people um, experience reward, and we can see even um, for drugs here like cocaine when they're um, this is another area I'm going to show something um, later where the craving and the amygdala is really important for for craving, but just again emphasizing the striatum. Um, for this nucleus accumbens, important for reward drug re, um, uh, reinforcement, but the dorsal parts of the striatum are also important for habit. So the addiction cycle um, is not, addiction is not a static um, disorder. It may start with the rewarding effects of the drug, but the habitual behavior, the, 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 the com compulsivity um, are mediated by many different circuits, many different brain regions in here, for example, the dorsal striatum. This is just to show again the amygdala that gets activated in humans with craving, with cue, the cues that um, trigger uh, uh, you know, aspects of association with the drug and just the emotional regulation that this area um, mediates. We know that different classes of, of drugs, different substances, whether it's, you know, they have unique pharmacological effects um obviously there are different classes of drugs such as opioids cannabis um, alcohol and so on and they are they they're they they're therefore impact on pharmacologically on different transmitter systems um dopamine i will come back to some aspects of glutamate and so on and our endogenous opioid system our endogenous cannabinoid system but one of the things that early on people recognized was that there are also commonalities once the addiction um, comes into play. And one thing, for example, dopamine gets a lot of attention because um, drugs that are particularly addictive, um, for example, cocaine or heroin or so on, when the person takes them, dopamine levels go up and that's been associated with the euphoria that these drugs may um, provide. And when 
the drug goes down and dopamine levels go down, they get dysphoric. And as I showed you, for example, accumbens activates dur during the reward. But the addiction process, as I said, is not a static, it's not a static disorder. So when someone takes a drug for the first time, dopamine goes up. They obviously go, goes up in other, when they take it even after they have become, a, 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 their behavior has become more compulsive and they, they take more drug. But what happens over time is that there is a shift and there's a shift in changing the structure of the brain. And in, in one way, the, the synapses, the areas where the different cells communicate with each other and make up the circuits of the brain. And we see that there is this reorganization of the, we call it the synaptic plasticity events that are very characteristic of addiction, substance use disorders. So the question for me and a lot of the work um, that I do and the program that we've built here at Sinai is to see whether or not understanding the neurobiology of substance use disorder can actually start giving us new insights into what treatment strategies might work. For me, a huge part of uh, the work, even though it's very challenging, was that I wanted to be able to study the human brain because substance use disorders are human disorders. And without understanding what is actually happening in the human brain, I think that it, it's, it's challenging, as I said, to develop treatments that will be very effective. But that goes hand in hand also with preclinical animal models because they provide us um, um, strategies to get more in depth, even on a molecular level, once we find targets from the human brain, and then we can test to see whether or not they, they may work in the animal models and then move it into clinical um, studies. So as I said, the human brain is very critical um, for my research. And sadly, a lot of substances that people abuse um, are deadly. And we have a brain bank collection, for example, with a lot of people who had been opioid, um, addicted to opioids. So we carry out molecular studies of the brain. And here, for example, this is a showing a profile of the genes that are changed. Um, this is actually the nucleus accumbens, for example, that are changed there in heroin users versus controls. And you don't have to be a molecular biologist or a computational scientist to see that the gene expression patterns differ significantly in a person that has heroin use disorder. And the question for us is, what differs? And so, for example, we could see, as I mentioned before, that there is actually a really strong dysregulation of this glutamatergic genes. And glutamate is a transmitter that is, um, if we're looking in the striatum, and I should have shown this earlier when we had that slide, um, the, the striatum receives a very strong glutamatergic innervation from the cortex. And so it's how the cortex is regulating the striatum. And so it's probably not surprising that we see a lot of glutamatergic synaptic plasticity alterations in the brains of human heroin users. Oh, here is a slide just to show the prefrontal cortex that um, and, and provides glutamate to the striatum. But what was surprising perhaps was the degree of epigenetic changes. And epigenetics, as I mentioned earlier, um, it, it, these are modifications on the DNA. And genetics, we inherit our genetics from our parents. That's it, it's not that you're gonna change it. But one of the things that makes addiction particularly a complex disorder is that the environment can control actually how your genes are turned on and off because these drugs themselves, not just the environment, the drugs are an environmental um, impact on your DNA and it leaves tags on the DNA. And so genes that perhaps should be turned on are not are turned off and those that should be off can be turned on by these drugs. And epigenetic mechanisms are actually long lasting. But I'm gonna come back that, to that and perhaps in the question and answer period, because I think that one of the things for me that's important about addiction, being really more of a disorder, I think of epigenetics um, that has a stronger role than even you know, the, the genetic factors, is that these modifications that are on their DNA, they can actually be reversed. We know that there are many epigenetic modifications. I'm not going to go into them for this audience. I know there are a lot of lay people out there, but it's just to say 
there are many of them. And when we we have started to get an insights into what do these modifications mean in terms of turning, like I said, genes on and off. And so, for example, the changes that we see in the brains of heroin users would actually, with this, we call this, this increased acetylation um, uh, on our DNA in a specific part, specific areas of the DNA, and they would allow for certain genes to be turned on, transcribed more. And we see that these epigenetic marks actually are tightly correlated to these glutamatergic genes in the brains of heroin users, but not uh, control subjects. And importantly, these epigenetic tags on the DNA are very specific. They're not happening all over our DNA. They're in the specific regions, and these regions that are actually master controllers, actually, and they correlate to the years of heroin use. So we know that the use of heroin contributes to it, the, the duration of heroin use contributes to these epigenetic changes. Importantly, we can actually replicate this in an animal model that self-administer heroin. We can go and look through the genome and see where it's changed, very similar to what we see in the brains of heroin users, and like I said, replicate it. And that is very important because now we can start to use the, the animal model to go in and see can we now start to develop treatments, a treatment strategy targeting some of these you know, epigenetic, very novel ways based on if we know the science, can the science start helping us? And so what are these epigenetic changes? As I mentioned, there are these acetylated um, tags that are put on the DNA, they're called these lysine tags. And where these specific lysine tags, so acetylation on your um, or the epigenetic marks, they have to either be put onto your DNA and they have to be read or they can be taken off. And this particular changes that we see are those that read these acetylated um, uh, tags. And there are medications that actually have been developed for these um, specific epigenetic marks. And those medications have been developed mainly for the cancer field, because cancer is really a disorder, I say, that gone awry, epigenetic disorder um, that has gone awry in their epigenetic um, modifications. So the cancer field has many different medications targeting these, and we can see whether or not some of these inhibitors of these epigenetic um, uh, tags could perhaps be effective as a drug abuse treatment. So that's one strategy that we looked in our animal models and we could see indeed when you, whether you give the, those inhibitors, these epigenetic inhibitors into the brains of animals that self-administer heroin, it could reduce their self-administration behavior. It actually reduced their drug seeking behavior. But importantly, we're never gonna make, develop a medication to be infused into the brain. But if we give these inhibitors systemically, we have a, a, a very strong, reduction of heroin self-administration behavior in these animal models. So we know that epigenetic inhibitors are a specific kind of epigenetic inhibitors that are not addictive, that it's going off what we see that is actually altered in the brains of heroin users, that we can translate it to the animal model, and we can actually reduce heroin self-administration in those animals. So that's the first strategy that, um, based on you know, studying the human brain, that we're going into in looking at epigenetics in, in for specific epigenetic marks. Another strategy is actually, once again, leveraging epigenetics. And here, we looked across the whole epigenome, across the whole genome, in both like neurons and glia, different cell types, to see in an unbiased manner, agnostic to knowing anything, if we just basically say where in the epigenome in a heroin abuser that is most changed, so we can identify that specific gene that has the, the most epigenetic changes. And we were really surprised, and I would say perhaps I shouldn't have been surprised, that when we looked, like I said, in the nucleus, at the epigenome, what is the most change in a heroin user in their striatum? And we found that there was, the in neurons specifically and not in glia, we saw that there was this change and it was related to this gene called FIN. And FIN is 
intriguing on many levels. <laughs> Finn is intriguing. Oops, where did that go? Finn is intriguing. We'll see because my computer is just being a little silly. Um, Finn is intriguing because it is a component of the synaptic ma machinery. Again, I mentioned how cells communicate with each other when glutamate is released and it's it, it, from the cortex of the striatum, it stimulates gl glutamatergic receptors in the striatum and that regulation, that synaptic machinery, is Finn is a huge part of, of that. However, Finn is also a, an important regulator because of tau. And hyperphosphorylated tau, as some of you know, is a pathological feature of many neurodegenerative disorders, including even Alzheimer's disease. So these high fin, um, activated fin hyperphosphorylates or phosphorylates tau. And a few years before we even had started these studies, looking at these epigenetic changes, molecular level of epigenetic changes, we had actually seen that in the brains of heroin users, that they had increased phosphorylated tau. At that time, I thought that most likely they had hit their heads, uh, you know, often from, you know, when they were intoxicated. But now we actually had molecular evidence of hyperphosphorylated tau in their brain. So it couldn't be due to just hitting their heads. And we were able to replicate this in our animal models so that we could see that there was increased um, uh, tau in animals that self-administered heroin. And even when we looked at in cells, we could see um, that opioids induce these um, hyperphosphorylated tau. This is important because now we can start to go mechanistically. So we can say, is Finn really relevant for heroin um, intake, uh, heroin-related behaviors? And when animals self-administer heroin, and we bring them to a point where they will take even more drug and we give them a fin inhibitor, they will actually reduce their self-administration. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, they will actually reduce their self-administration of heroin. We can go in and we can also genetically reduce um, fin. And once again, we can reduce the animal's self-administration of heroin. So by looking in the animal model, um, we were able to see that, um, oh, sorry, there's an extra one here. This is just saying the same thing that I showed, sorry. Um, but one of the things about, I wanted to say that when we are developing these medications, this is basically showing what I showed before, um, that it reduced her in self-administration. We wanna develop medications that won't, you know, impact on every rewarding thing in the person's life. So even when we have animals self-administer for food, um, inhibiting fin does not change their food intake. So those are the kind of things that we can see in terms of developing um, medications like um, a fin inhibitor that's actually being developed for, um, for Alzheimer's disorder that we can now start to see, take that into clinical trials because it's clear from studying the human brain that there are epigenetic and the synaptic regulation that's extremely um, dysregulated with, with opioids. And they now can be targeted because we have these epigenetic really, uh, targeted drugs from another field that we can repurpose for a substance use disorder. And even here, a drug that is being developed for Alzheimer's and perhaps other um, neurodegenerative disorders could also perhaps be repurposed based on what we see in um, in our our molecular studies that's happening in in the human brain. So oh, this is just to say what I just said about specific epigenetic um, and synaptic um, dysregulation may provide targets for treatment development. I want to emphasize I showed you um, that this fin inhibitor which um, reduces tau, hyperphosphorylated tau, was important for heroin self-administration. Other groups have been studying it as well. And here, Dorit um, uh, runs group um, in, in San Francisco. They're looking at it with alcohol. And they're in, the, in their alcohol self-administration model, inhibiting fin also decreases alcohol intake. 
so these are medications. This is just showing um, uh, alcohol-seeking behavior as, as well. Um, so these, this is a medication that could cross-cut many different substances. And we know that people with a substance use disorder, even though many may have a primary substance that they abuse, they will also take other substances as well. So what are some of the common mechanisms that are changed with multiple substances of abuse? They lend themselves for targeting um, for developing um, medications, which I think is actually a good thing. It doesn't have to be only, 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 only specific to just um, just opioids or just alcohol. This is one of the things I think that is 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 really important. The third um, aspect um, for different things that we're trying to develop actually stemmed from our animal models. And I started off by saying that for me, you know, it's really critical for understanding the human brain. Um, but here we started looking at, you know, can we indeed learn something from our animal models? And it, and it, it, it goes that you have to actually, and in science, many people in the public does believe us, the data is the data. It's not that we're trying to find something. So here, this line of um, new treatments that we're trying to develop stem from the fact that we were studying the developmental effects of cannabis. And whenever we looked at um, developmental THC exposure, for example, we could see that in animals that, you know, that had a prenatal exposure to THC and they were given um, access to freely self-administer heroin, they would self-administer heroin more. Um, and even under conditions where we made it that they could self-administer the same, they could have um, self-administer the same heroin, if those animals, the adult animals that had prenatal exposure to THC, they basically ran much faster. The latency to hit that first lever was very, was much faster than, than uh, normal subjects. And in adolescence, we saw that if you gave um, THC to adolescent rats and studied them as, as adults, they self-administered more heroin. So we have been looking at the molecular and biochemical changes that what makes this long-term protracted effects of of you know cannabis we said you know um last throughout their lives that we could study them as adults and see these long-term effects and just like we saw for um heroin for example you can see that they're really well this is showing um, this epigenetic changes, these epigenetic changes that relates to genes that are also coupled to synaptic plasticity. So on the top side are vehicle um, animals, that, adults that were treated with vehicle, uh, and there's not a real relationship between epigenetic genes and those that dis dysregulate the synapse. But in the THC exposed animals, there's a complete reorganization. So we know from a lot of work that developmental THC impacts on epigenetic mechanisms that control synaptic plasticity. But one of the things that's hit me at one point was the fact that in our animal models, and coming back again to what are we studying in our animal models and why it's really important to have um, studies in the human, because in our animal models, we were actually studying THC. But when we write our papers and write our grants, we of course say that we're studying cannabis. And cannabis we know contains over 140 cannabinoids and other chemicals, terpenes, et cetera. So I said, let's at least study another cannabinoid. And here we looked at cannabidiol, CBD. And it's important to emphasize that, you know, many people, if you look at the structure, I mean, bring it back, many people, especially lay people, perhaps can't see a difference in the structure of THC and CBD. Yet still, there's a huge difference in these cannabinoids. They have very different actions. So for example, THC induces reward. And we know the higher the THC concentration, the, more, the greater the addiction vulnerability. Hence, one of the reasons why, you know, the increase THC in the cannabis being smoked recreationally today, that it's gone up so much, that is a problem that you know, we are seeing. Because CBD does not have that rewarding intoxicating effects that you see with, with, with THC. Also, anxiety um, 
many people and many of our patients who have a cannabis use disorder that will tell us that they they smoke cannabis to deal with their anxiety. However, it actually exacerbates their anxiety. And THC with anxiety really comes down to dose. Low doses can indeed reduce anxiety, but we're talking about, you know, as I said, these recreational concentrations of THC that are very high. And early studies showed suggested that CBD reduced anxiety. The side effects also are very different from THC, having these memory impact, um, cognitive impairing uh, cognition, judgment, you know, um, impacting a motor coordination and so on. And the side effects seen with, with CBD, um, unless you're, you know, more gastrointestinal in terms of diarrhea and so on, and at high doses, um, probably drowsiness that now people are even using as a, as a positive thing for looking at CBD. So with all of that said, when we started looking at CBD, we were actually surprised to see something very different from what we had seen with THC. In fact, CBD reduced Q-induced um, reinstatement of heroin-seeking behavior. What I mean by that is that when animals are self-administer um, a drug, just like humans, their environmental um, cues that then take on significance of the drug. And you can just show them that cue. For example, the light that goes on in the box when they're self-administering drug, and just seeing that light alone, they start pressing the lever even a lot, even though they're not getting the drug. And that's what CBD did. It actually specifically decreased um, drug-seeking behavior. And another way that it differed significantly from, from uh, well, that was a huge thing. It decreased um, heroin-seeking behavior while I said THC increased heroin self-administration itself. But CBD did something also where even weeks after the last CBD administration, it still decreased heroin-seeking behavior in the animals despite the fact that um, CBD was no longer in their system. So I mentioned and I showed you earlier that heroin abuse is characterized by these, you know, glutamatergic, um, profound glutamatergic changes in the brain. And based on the fact that we know that glutamate plays a critical role in a number of brain structures important to craving, the question for me was also, does CBD do anything to some of the molecular changes that we see in hu the human brain? And, in, and especially, like I said, in relation to synaptic plasticity. And indeed, we could see that um, here, these are animal studies, when we animals self-administer heroin, it changes some of the glutamatergic genes and CBD normalized that. Um, the cannabinoid receptor actually is a, a critical regulator of synaptic transmission. And when animals self-administer heroin, just like in humans also, it dysregulates these cannabinoid receptors and CBD normalized that. So the goal was, can we now carry clinical trials for a drug that we know is, um, at least at that time, was safe from what we were seeing and look in individuals with an opioid use disorder? And it, we carried out double-blinded placebo-controlled study and looked at Q-induced craving. And it's critical for when, you know, we have a lot of, um, in, in society today, everyone says, oh, this works for treating this or that works for treating that. But none of those studies were carried out blind on a, in a blinded manner or placebo controlled manner. So here um, for these studies, neither the participants, study participants, nor the um, investigators knew uh, what the, they were taking or given. And one of the things that we could see, we would show individuals um, videos, whether a neutral video or a heroin video, and those who had received placebo, they craved. And CBD reduced that. We brought them back a week later after their final CBD administration, and CBD still reduced their craving. One of the things we hadn't studied at that time, but our animal models later on, um, based on the animal human work, we then went back to our animal models and we could see anxiety. So when they were shown the heroin cue, they became very anxious and CBD reduced their anxiety. And once again, a week later, CBD reduced um, their, was still reducing their anxiety. 
it also had physiological effects. So when we, you know, the craving and anxiety are self-reports, but the, this is their physiology, their cortisol level, their stress hormone levels. When they see a drug cue, their stress hormone levels go up and CBD reduce that. Similarly, their heart rate, other physiological measures, their heart rate goes up when they see a drug cue compared to a new, when, they don't, when they see a neutral cue and CBD reduce that. So at least for this cannabinoid, not THC, but for CBD, we see that it holds promise for opiate use disorder, at least in relation to craving and anxiety. And of course, we're now you know, trying to figure out the most effective dose because the doses, we're not sure if those are the most effective dose and the treatment regimen and the formulation and deliverer systems and are doing neuroimaging now in human subjects to try to get a, a better understanding as to why CBD is working. And again, I'm just gonna emphasize CBD is I mean, shown in animal models here is looking at alcohol intake. And CBD actually reduced alcohol intake, just like we saw in our animals for heroin seeking behavior. And even months later, CBD, after the last CBD administration, they're still reducing their alcohol intake, and even if they're stressed. So it is not just for something for, for opiate use, it can be for other substances. It may be for other substances as well, and that's why clinical trials are needed to, to, to understand that. So the last part um, deals with a more, how can I put it, a more con perhaps contra not controversial, but a, a wilder way of thinking about what have we learned about the human brain that could be developed for a treatment in the, you know, the futuristic strategies. And so it's provocative, but something I think that you know, as technology improves, and there are aspects of technology that are definitely going in this direction, could this be something? So this starts off coming back to what I actually started off with in terms of about the, the brain circuits and brain circuitry that we see are highly dysregulated in substance use disorder, even if, trust me, addiction is a whole brain disorder, but it's, can this give us insights? And this stems from, and I'll, I'll use this particular aspect about uh, addiction risk. And as I showed you earlier, we know that psychiatric comorbidity is very high with substance use disorders, and in particular, anxiety and, and major depression are, are, are huge. And so a brain area that we know in the field is very critical for emotional regulation, and um, it's especially anxiety, is the amygdala. And the amygdala, many years ago, I had started studying a um, neuropeptide in the amygdala that is an opioid peptide, and it's actually a peptide that regulates the negative mood states that we have, the dysphoria, while the other classes of opioids are endogenous heroin, you could say, like beta endorphin and so on. Um, they are, you know, they are they produce positive effects. But dynorphin actually is does the opposite. And in looking at the amygdala of people who had heroin use disorder or cocaine, we saw that this dynorphin gene was actually dysregulated, but it was dysregulated in a very discrete, very narrow region of the human brain. And here, um, this is, uh, we looked at um, heroin self um sorry, people who had self had taken heroin and died in different um, cohorts of people. We see the reduction of this dynorphin in this specific amygdala area, but we also see it in people who were diagnosed with major depression disorder. So it's not that this particular molecular change in the brain is specific to substance use disorder. It seems, at least in this brain area, relevant to negative affective states. So how do we figure out, and it's a brain area that no one studied because very few people studied the human brain. And that particular brain area is so tiny. And so the question for us was like, how do we figure out what that brain region may be about? And so in looking at our animal model, we were able to find the similar change as we saw in humans, but at a time period following, for example, um, hair and self-administration like a day later when they're really craving with this acute stress withdrawal, and we found the change in those animals. So in order to figure out what this 
these cells, these few cells in this in, in um, the the brain mediated, we use a we combine strategies of um, using a virus to go into the brain and delivered an artificial receptor. And this artificial receptor would only be um, activated when we gave them a, 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 an agonist and, and it's inert. We can say it has no other biological effects, this designer receptor, and it's only going into those few cells. And then we imaged the animals. And we well, we call this um, technique dread is, dread is for um, a designer, um, designer receptor. And when we activated only those few cells that we saw that were changed in, in people with major depression and people with uh, um, addiction, it was fascinating. It was fascinating because it was a very specific circuit that was activated um, just due to changing the, the activity of these first, these few, um, um, these few cells. And what's important is that the circuit that was activated is a circuit that had been hypothesized to be really critical for maladaptive responses in terms of anxiety and stress. And it had been implicated in psychiatric disorders. And here we could, we could actually trigger the circuit just by activating these few cells. And when we did that in the animal, just changing the firing activity of these few cells, we could change the animal's cortisol levels, so we can knock, we can increase or decrease cortisol levels. The animals became um, anhedonic and showed depression-like behavior when we changed the activity of those few cells, similar to what we saw in humans. So, I bring up this scientific evidence to emphasize one thing that I think a lot of people miss in the neurobiology of addiction, in fact, the neurobiology of psychiatric disorders. We know it's not a one gene disorder. We know it's about circuits. We know it's about these individual cells. And these individual cells can mediate and change like your physiological effects of your, your stress hormone and make you more or less depressed. So the question is, can we start using, sorry, can we start, can we target a few of these genes to now change the activity of that circuit. And then that person just takes an, a, a drug that doesn't, it's like a, doesn't impact on any other um, cell or activity in their, in their brain or body. And now um, they can get back to quote unquote normal. So that's what we've been working on from a scientific perspective, oops, sorry, um, where we can we, we know that there are these distinct epigenetic changes in the brains of people with substance use disorder. And in this synaptic plasticity with the glutamatergic dysregulation, and that some of these medications that we might start to, to develop, we've started already with CBD, but these epigenetic modifications can also be targeted. And also understanding that there are discrete circuits that are dysregulated and can these discrete circuits be targets for future, for developing future medication. So I know I talked a lot about, um, a, a lot about, you know, futuristic things, but based on what we're seeing in our uh, studying the human brain and it's a whole team of events. And I start uh, backwards in terms of Ed Salsis, who's an amazing, I would say one of my favorite ad addiction medicine physician. If you ever need help, Ed Salsis is the person um, you should, absolutely uh, contact. Um, and, you know, my team who are very hard working both in the basic science and understanding the molecular biology of, of addiction, but also our clinical team in trying to, you know, bring these, um, these discoveries to reality by actually studying them in, um, in clinical trials. So I will stop and then take any questions. Well, um... Yasmin, thank you for just a, a, an extraordinary overview of the very exciting work that, that's going on. And I think it, it, when we talk about stigma and psychiatric illness, stigma and chemical dependency, better understanding how the brain works um, really shows this isn't moral weakness, character weakness. This is a brain illness like other illnesses. Um, and you're demonstrating how that information can inform new treatments. So 
thank you for, for all that you're doing and for just a, a wonderful presentation. Thank uh, you. I know there's a lot of science and molecular, but I hope that it didn't scare too many people off. No, it, it didn't. And I think it really um, helps uh, people have an understanding of, of how science works. And I, I want to ask you a little bit, because you, you really explain sort of the interplay between um, the human brain and then using animal models, et cetera. Um, we, what do you see as, as the next steps um, moving forward um, as we better understand these mechanisms and, and look at new treatments? I mean, for me, I think the next steps has, they really have to be translating more. As I said, there's a lot of research that's being done that has been done on addiction neurobiology, yet still very, very, very few of them ever gets translated. And we need to have a, a programs that this work might not get published in the, you know, the highest um, you know, nature and science journals because it's not may not have the you know the latest fancy scientific tools but without those types of research we're not going to get translation into treatment so treatment has to be a goal and treatment has to be a goal based on science for me why else are we you know i believe in fundamental science don't get me wrong in terms of fundamental knowledge but there has to be a line and a big a big program carved out for moving the, the science to helping humans. <laughs> and so that's what I'm hoping we will start doing more. Um, absolutely, absolutely. And, and you, your presentation shows how that potentially will happen, uh, hopefully sooner rather than later as the science progresses. You, you spoke about um, the THC and CBD. Um, we all are aware of um, the legalization of, of marijuana um, across the country. And I'm curious, what is your perspective in terms of uh, potential risks that uh, legalizing marijuana may bring about um, for people? Yeah, I mean, it, it's definitely a double-edged sword, you know, because for me, no one should have been locked up for cannabis use. I think actually for all substances, I think should be out of the criminal justice system. It's a healthcare issue. And unless of course someone is selling something, that's a different thing. But for people with a, a substance use disorder, locking them up has proven not to work. It has not improved um, their lives, their disorder, and in fact made it worse. The legalization of cannabis we know has an impact for me, in particular for the research that we do, looking at the developmental effects, whether you know it's you know during pregnancy, we've seen that the numbers of, of women who are pregnant women using cannabis has gone up, and all of our work shows that there are long-term negative impact on the offspring. We also know in terms of teenagers and the and young adults, because the brain is not yet fully mature. And for whatever reason, Obviously, you know, the, our endogenous cannabinoid system plays a really critical role in, in neurodevelopmental processes and hard wiring of the brain during fetal development and even during adolescence in those final pruning and so on. So high exposure to THC during those times can impact the developing the brain into adulthood because we don't see it's necessarily some of the similar things when someone starts abusing these drugs later in life. Not that it, they don't impact the brain, but it's not to the same extent of the, the, the psychiatric comorbidity. So I think the legalization without even including clinicians and scientists as part of those discussions, I think, you know, was wrong, but I don't think that we should criminalize. I think that we need a huge education platform that the government needs to start implementing about cannabis use now that it's been you know legalized in so many states so education is key and it should start very young and to um, parents and to teens and so on and very important point first of all 
um, people, uh, an illness shouldn't be criminalized, whether it be chemical dependency or other psychiatric conditions, people should get treatment. Um, and then the risks of marijuana use, especially at a younger age, especially during pregnancy. And brains are still developing and pruning even through the mid twenties. So obviously that's some, that's a, an age group that we need to be concerned about. Um, so I think those are all very important points. Uh, I wanna um, ask one, one last question. And you spoke about depression, anxiety, and, and other comorbid illnesses. I wanna ask you about dual diagnosis and um, your perspective in terms of um, people who may have a, a major depression or anxiety disorder, other conditions along with the chemical dependency and how this all fits in. And when you say how this will fix it, so for dual diagnosis, as you know, it's really challenging. Right. I mean, but it's actually quite common because whether or not, so, you know, the whole, whether or not someone starts off with a psychiatric disorder and took drugs, many people think, you know, to self-medicate or whether the repeated, you know, use of drugs induce that psychiatric um, related change, some of the similar neural circuits are, are, are altered, right? And the, many people treat the symptoms. So you wanna make sure that person is reducing their, their drug use, even though, as you know, many people who are using the drugs are saying that they're using it to decrease their anxiety, decrease you know, um, their depression. But we know that those drugs that they're using exacerbate it. And what people often do is they, mis they misinterpret intoxication for being, for relieving anxiety. And so, I mean, and that's a tough thing to tell a patient, obviously, right? They're intoxicated, so they feel better, but it's not, it's actually exacerbating long-term their anxiety, exacerbating long-term their depression. So that's why, you know, if we don't come up with treatments that, in fact, to your question, that um, addresses some of the common, um, the common behavioral, psychological um, conditions that are, that are similar between, you know, some of the psychiatric and addiction disorders, it's going to be tough to have long-lasting effective treatments. So, as I said, it's tough to tell someone that, you know, using your meth over, you know, um, is not going to reduce your anxiety. But we need to like treat the the symptoms because that often contributes. So treat con like treating the anxiety, treating the depression, because that indeed often contributes to the repeated drug use. So if that can be managed, rather than saying, okay, you know, let's treat your addiction, you have to do them simultaneously. But treating the symptoms help. I I think your point about treating both simultaneously is so important. Um, we need to treat the whole person, not just one aspect of the person. Yeah. And you can't treat one without the other. You can't treat the depression and not the chemical dependency, nor vice versa. You need to treat the whole person. So um, extremely important. I, I, I want to again thank you. Um, the, the work that you're doing is extraordinary and to me uh, offers tremendous hope. And you made the point about how no or very few new approaches to treatment have happened uh, over a long period of time. But I think the research that you described is gonna bring about uh, new approaches that will really have an impact on people's lives. Um, so thank you for that. Thank you very much for inviting me. And you know, I hope that the audience and others realize that there is a, a really strong research and science out there we just have to find a way to translate them. And even though I focused in large part on pharmacological treatments, and this last part on provocative that even perhaps a, a newer, a fine-tuned, you know, neurosurgical, uh, well, it's not complete surgery, intervention may be something futuristic. It's everything together that's needed. So I don't want people to throw out behavioral um, interventions. 
those are also critical in working together with, you know, even if we find quote unquote a medication, it will not be a miracle drug. So it's everybody, everyone working together to try to um, um, both behavioral, pharmacological, surgical, and so on to help. Look, like we talk about the whole, the whole person. Very, very good point and important point. And the other key point, and you brought this up at the beginning of your presentation, too many people are not diagnosed nor are they getting treatment. And the reality is even in the here and now, even before new treatments are developed, there are plenty of treatments available and many people are able to um, accomplish being in recovery and being drug free and living a, a full healthy life. And that's Absolutely. something people should remember. Absolutely, um, thank you. Thank you. Um, I also wanna thank everybody uh, for joining us today. 100% uh, of all donor contributions for research are invested in our grants to scientists. All of the research we fund is made possible through supporters like you. So please consider making a gift by visiting bbrfoundation.org or call us at 1-800 829-8289. This webinar has been recorded. If you've missed any portion or would like to share it with family and friends, please visit the events and webinars page on our website. I hope you'll join us again next month when Dr. Nolan Williams, Assistant Professor of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences at Stanford University Medical Center, will present using rapid acting brain stimulation for treatment resistant depression. This webinar will take place on Tuesday, May 11th at 2 p.m. Eastern time. Once again, thank you for joining us. Take care, bye.